evening, everybody, and welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, the number one podcast of all things Assassin's Creed. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 115 of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. In this episode, we are going to talk about a single character, our new, perhaps, modern-day protagonist, Basim. Um, and we can't do this alone. We need someone who is an expert uh, in this topic. Now, um, before I introduce her, I will just say that uh, when Declan does his uh, midweek tweet announcing the upcoming episode we 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 get a little bit of engagement and people looking forward to it when he announced that uh, six keys was joining us to talk about basim this week i have never seen so many likes and uh, comments and people looking forward to this episode so uh, declan are you prepared i think i'm prepared i'm never prepared <laughs> <laughs> six keys welcome to the show are you prepared thank you um i hope so <laughs> <laughs> excellent um, where do we start? I'll tell you one thing, when I was doing some reading, and first of all, I want to say thank you to Access the Animus for your uh, in-depth lore analysis of uh, a series uh, on YouTube of um, Valhalla, because I rewatched a number of those videos this afternoon to remind myself of the closing cutscenes. And one of the things I, I remembered was he was one of the characters that we got that beautiful kind of um, character art for before the game was released, him, Hytham, and just a few others. So he was clearly being singled out right at the start, that this was a, a major character to watch. Um, what, where do we start with his story? So we, we know that he is, or was, um, a hidden one. He travelled with Sigurd to Fornberg to meet Eivor. He didn't know he was meeting Eivor, but he travelled with Sigurd because he, he thought that Sigurd was someone important. Where where my knowledge starts to run out is on the kind of the Norse mythology. So, I mean, Declan, do you want to talk us through the connections between the characters of Eivor's time and the, the Norse mythology um, connections? So this is where things can get interesting and... It's a good point to reference something um, that Six Keys brought up. The only connection we really have is all the sages are kind of linked to the gods. So uh, Eivor is Harvey, which is Odin himself, and Basim is Loki, which is the trickster and the renegade rogue from Jotunheim. The kind of schwavy kind of guy. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I had to put that in. But the trouble I'm having is... Loki in the in the mythology and in the game is completely different. Now, I'm really kind of excited to see Six Key's reaction to this, but in the first mission in Asgard, you meet the builder, you build the wall, which is completely different to mythology. It's good. But Loki isn't a shapeshifter, and that's important because to beat the builder... Loki shapeshifts into a into a horse, lures the builder's horse, and gives birth to a six-legged horse. Right. I really don't think Loki as a person could give birth to a six-legged <laughs> horse. <laughs> I knew I'd get a giggle. I knew I was going to get a giggle for that. Yeah. So, mm, okay, that that's yeah. hang on. I don't remember this part of the game. I presume we're talking <laughs> about the the real Norse myth here, not what we saw in in the Asgard arc, right? Correct, and this is where. And this is where I'm Although gonna... there is a reference to it, like um, one of the shields that you can, I think it's a Reda item, uh, it actually has an encarving of the horse. Oh, interesting. Okay. So... I wear that shield a lot. <laughs> ah, very good. Very good. I forget what its name is. Oh, I've totally forgot. I know the horse is important because it's o it gifts it yeah, to it's, Odin. Yeah, it's Odin's horse. Like the, the horse that Loki gives birth to is. Uh, I guess it becomes Odin's horse or something. I don't know what what the chain of events is that leads to that. But <laughs> I, th I think he gifts it as a uh, apology because it's him who basically basically tells all of the Asgardians to let the builder do his work. You know, mm. let him do it. He can't do it. Those stones are heavy. Blah 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 blah. And when he realizes, oh no, the builders are giants. We're screwed. Everyone blames Loki. So Loki's like, hey, look. I've took his horse away. He's failed the bet. Here's a horse I've just give birth to to apologize. And oh. the, reason... uh, the horse apparently is called Slipnir or Slipnir. Um the, oh, right. the, yeah. the child of Loki and Svath Svathilfari. Svathilfari, yeah. Okay. However okay. you pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah. And 
the reason I bring this up is because um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is differing a lot from the Norse myths, which is great, you know, it's like balancing it. Could this mean that Harvey's interpretation of Loki is biased? Could the personality we see of Loki through Harvey's memories be not the re real Loki, opening up the possibilities that we don't know what Basim's true personality in the modern day will be? That's I like that interpretation or that possible way of opening up. Um, what's the right way of saying it? Yes, it, it gives opportunities for him not to follow a preset, um, stereotypical kind of um, character for the trickster, shall we say. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. It's like there's two possibilities as I see it. It's uh, either that, um, like, what we see is that, um, like, Basim and Loki are two very different personalities. If you, like, if you look at how, like, Basim is so secretive and, like, a master manipulator and calm and all this, and then you look at Loki, how he appears in Javi's memories, or Eivor's memories as Javi. Um, he is, um, he's like a bad liar, uh, like very obviously shifty the whole time. <laughs> uh, he's proud and boastful. Um, uh, like when, when he, uh, when he sees his son in the cage, he, he like he can't resist making a comment like, look at his strong haunches. He must come from powerful stock. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. I don't remember those <laughs> yeah. lines of dialogue, but that's really, oh, I like that. That's really interesting. Um, but it, like, he's, he's such a different person there. And it's that, that's what makes me think that it's possible that we are seeing Javi's biased view of him. Like he, he has been suspicious of Loki this whole time. So of course his memories of him are going to be colored by this view. So he's always seen him as like a shifty character. But then we see Basim and it's like, you know, they obviously they don't recognize each other because they're both totally different. So could it be like a similar situation as Eivor has with Odin, where it's this totally different personality with maybe some similarities, but he's trying to like tempt her the whole time to give in and become like a vessel for what he what he is and what he wants. So it could be that these like the personality of Basim, which is much more calm, and the personality of Loki, who is just much more chaotic, they could be clashing in a similar way. Yeah. Um, like, that's that's one possibility, that they're sort of tempering each other, that there's maybe still a bit of the real Basim somewhere in there. Uh, or it could be that that it's a biased view of that... that that the Loki that we see in Javi's memories is this biased view and he's not at all actually like that. Or he wasn't like that in so-called real life. Mm. When um, at the end of, well, not taught, yeah, I suppose it is the end of Valhalla or near to the end of Valhalla. So um, Layla and the assassins travel to Norway and Layla, what's the right word, joins with the machine, connects with the machine, enters the grey. Perhaps that's the right way of saying it. And and then we we cut back to the cabin and and boom we have Basim um, emerging should we say in the modern day. Um, what was your reaction, both of you, um, to seeing Basim and and what did, how did you measure his character? Because straight away I thought I don't trust this guy. But rewatching some of the the cut scenes and so on this evening and, and rereading some of the plot points, I felt I felt a lot more sympathetic to him. I still don't know whether I trust him, but I kind of can't fault his motivations. You know, he was perhaps badly treated by Javi 77,000 years ago. Um, and you know what? It's a 77,000 year love story and he wants to be reunited with his love. And I, I've got to respect that. But how did you sort of measure his character when he when he emerged in the in the modern day? Do you want to take it, Six Keys? <laughs> Um, yeah, like, obviously I was, you know, my mind was totally blown. Like I expected mm. it to become like another cliffhanger that would stop at the moment when he says like a new world awaits us. 
And then, you know, cut to credits. Like, (laughs) okay, I guess now we're just going to have to wait. Wait and see what happens, just like with Juno. And then, you know, that that would not lead to anything. (laughs) But then they sort of force the situation, like, no, there's more, <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is a situation you, the whoever writes the next game or, or continuation cannot ignore. And that was just really exciting to me. Like, you can't just cut to, cut to the credits and say, uh, and then Basim died back on the way he, to his home planet, <laughs> you know? That would, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if he, if he died in his sleep. Yeah, that would be. You right, have yeah. to. You have to at least explain yes. what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah. maybe do it in a comic or in a in a file on the laptop or something. You know. Um, yeah. No, no. I'm being I'm being facetious now. Um, and I think w- what makes him uh, like one of the many things that makes him an interesting character to me is I feel like throughout the whole game, uh, he's like he he's definitely a character who feels like he has been deeply wronged like his whole family and he is constantly seeking a way to tell his own story to someone like he has that he's like seeking this connection with someone like from the beginning he sends that message that is like you know come find me uh come find out what happened find Mm. the mad one find me and then through the um, the animus anomalies, uh, we hear those recordings from his life, and that's like he is telling his story. He didn't have to record those things for whoever to find, you know. There he's he's glitches, you know. <laughs> he didn't have to leave anything there, but it was almost like he he had this need to, like, if this plan if this plan of his was never going to succeed, at least someone would get to hear his story and hear the injustice that was done to him. And then we have, of course, then we have the campfire scene with Eivor where, you know, he's been this very mysterious character the whole time and Eivor hasn't been sure if if she can trust him. And then he tells his very personal story to her and it, like, the whole relationship changes in that moment so i think he's really a character who has this need even though he's like withheld but but there's something inside him that's like driving him to tell his story and be heard i'm glad you mentioned the campfire scene because that's that's a hell of a scene um, yeah <laughs> just from the the motion capture the animation the the lighting and and then the the performances of the actors. I, I wish there was more like that. But yeah, that yeah, kind of too. you feel like that that pivoted the entire I mean, I guess that's why they invested the time and money on that scene, because that pivoted the entire story. Um, and I, I didn't trust him when he first arrived in uh, Norway. And then he, he was kind of I felt like he was dripping I suppose he was, he was kind of dripping poison into uh, Sigurd's ear. Um whilst whilst Eivor was remaining very grounded. And then they ran off to, was it Oxenafordshire? I can't remember which arc it was, but they disappeared off while Eivor sort of got on with the the drudge work of running a family and running a clan. Um, And I just thought, come on, mate, you could be helping us here, but you're off chasing flights of fancy. Um, So I I didn't really trust him at all. And then you have that scene, you think, oh, okay, yeah, you've you've got backstory and you've got a drive um, to, of course, we know it mirrors his... his, um, not historical what's the word his his ancestral drive as well um, yeah is mirrored uh, Declan you wanted to say something um I was just gonna say I think I've got six uh, six Basim all wrong like it's weird because when I saw his arc and the story played out it wasn't until I saw the truth videos and as going on that played out I kind of thought subconsciously the reason why he was forcing Eivor to run a clan look after a family was because that was stuff that Odin never really did. Odin was not a good old father. He just went off and did his own thing for knowledge. But Loki tried to be a father. But in the Norse mythologies, it was the gods that got involved. You know, they took his three kids off him. Hel was locked into Mulsfein. Um Jotunringa was locked as the world serpent. So I, f- I kind of felt like subconsciously Basim was remembering Loki and 
forcing Eivor to have the trials and tribulations of a man who wanted to look after his clan, a man who wanted to look after his family, but he never got the chance because the gods never respected him. So I feel like my interpretation of Bastion may be a bit weird, especially at the end, because when I saw him at the end, I kind of thought like he's gone from a guy who would just try and teach Harvey a lesson to a guy who's probably going to set the world on fire to get what he wants. <laughs> and I have some pretty bad ideas of how he can set the world on fire to get what he wants. <laughs> so, I think we need to hear all of these bad ideas. Um, oh, well, <laughs> and I'm must... saying bad ideas tongue in cheek because hey, <laughs> all ideas are good are fun. So let's let's talk about them. Um, I would love Six Keys' views on them as well. Um, the first one is Instruments of the First Will. I've talked about it to death, but I still believe Basim could try and hunt down the Instruments of the First Will again because they brought Juno back to life. So could they try and bring Alfir out the staff? And an Assassin Revolution. We, and my law's a bit rusty, but we know that the Assassins have been hiding since the Great Purge. We know that William Miles is the head of them, but with Basim saying, you know, the assassins should be fighting the Templars, taking the fight to them, that's not what William wants. William wants to be in the shadow. So could it be possible that Basim starts a revolution to get the assassins to fight the Templars because he knows something about his family is hidden inside the Templars? Yeah, it's uh, obviously... Very difficult to speculate about the future. They could go in any direction they wanted, and especially depending on the writer. Uh, but uh, what I'm speculating at the moment is that he he may be playing both sides. Um, like he obviously he wants, or or he's looking for some kind of way we don't know if it exists yet or if it's something he wants to create but he's looking for some kind of way or technology to bring back his family and whoever controls that kind of technology or that knowledge is the one that can help him so whether that's the assassins or the templars we don't know that yet um but i i feel like he like he's acting friendly to the towards the assassins at the moment but you know, he could turn coat uh, at any time if he realizes that maybe the Templars are the ones who have what, whatever he needs. So I'm I'm very curious to see where it goes from here. Yeah, we see that just this is just something that, that popped into my head because it's, it's fresh. So just finished um, replaying Syndicate's main story a couple of days ago. Um, and there's a there's a cut scene right at the end where we see uh, what's the scientist's name? Is it Grammatica? I can't remember yeah. his first name. And he's Albaro. in right. Okay, thank you. So he's in some lab and he's got these creatures, clones, whatever. It looks like something out of Star Wars growing in in tanks, which I understand is part of the whole re re recover a, a precursor or re re recreate a precursor. Um, and you feel like that would be an ideal way of somehow bringing Aletheia back to a corporeal form rather than a sort of a spiritual or, or technological form in, in, encased in a staff. But one thing I just thought of, though, that, that all works because you, you've had um, you've got Basim with the, the memories and the, the spirit. I'm not really sure, ever sure what the right word is. Let's say the spirit of, of Loki. You've got Aletheia's um, spirit or consciousness in the staff he couldn't bring his children back unless they were somehow preserved somewhere either in the gray or um also as sages which i guess they wouldn't be unless that again that happens off screen that somehow he he snuck in his children's dna into the the human uh, gene pool um, yeah that's, that's the interesting thing like we kind of i think we all assumed that they were dead uh, that they all died at ragnarok so why mm. would he you know why would he specifically mention his family so not just yeah. his wife but his children so oh like they're still alive somehow <laughs> you know i've just what? had a thought so um, when, you know what declan when we did our, our um crossover trailer and our dawn of ragnarok reaction and and i said that my reaction to the to dawn of ragnarok as a trailer was meh 
I'm, I'm starting to think if this might explore Loki's three children and maybe what happened to them and how did they survive Ragnarok or how were they preserved? That that I don't know if it will. Again, we're speculating, but that that, that might be enough to make me want to go and play the story and, and see what happens. That is um, definitely my motivation. Like I yeah. I'm so invested in the whole Balder thing. Understood. Yep. Yep. Go on, Declan. And technically, but um Logie had six children. Oh, did he? And this is where things are gonna get interesting. Prepare for your mind's blown. <laughs> so this is what I was going to pass to use to in a minute um, your thoughts we know he's hunted down Harvey because Harvey's done him wrong because it, it was at Harvey's orders that his three children uh, Hell, Yorminda, the World Serpent and oh, what was it? Fenrir were captured mm. but after the death of Boulder which would be the capture of Boulder in this case his first three children, no, his first two children, actually, so it's five, not six, were captured with his wife, and Loki was imprisoned on a rock. This is all Norse myth. And they asked him what the biggest sin was, which was um, betraying your own brothers. So they forced Loki's eldest to mutate into, I think it was a wolf in the myths, and kill his youngest, and then set him free. Bloody. This, so... <laughs> This is where I, think I want to know. We, if they do try and follow Norse myths a little bit, but give it their own scene and Bold has been captured, what if they're going to explore the two children that we don't know about? We know from the Norse myths there's Fenrir, there's the World Serpent, and there's Hel. And it was Hel who was actually holding Boulder in Molsfime in the mythology because Loki had to. Everyone had to weep for Balder to be released, but Loki didn't. It's why Thor uh, trapped Loki and killed his two, his, well, his youngest ch child. So, in your opinion, could this be something the DLC could explore? I would love to see how, like, um, I, I there's there's an item in the game, uh, like a statue that you can buy for Ravensthorpe, uh, that shows Loki with uh, both his sons, uh, with Fenrir and Jormungandr, but uh, no hell, and I'm so <laughs> annoyed about that. Really? Oh, that's a sh Okay. It's yeah. the centerpiece of my settlement, obviously. Nice, nice. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really curious, you know, what his relationship is with his daughter. Mm. Because I think in mm. the myths, um, I think in the myths there's something like hell falls in love with Baldur or something like that? I don't remember. Declan probably knows. Um, I'm not too sure. I haven't read that far in North Smith, I will admit. <laughs> I just did some <laughs> brief Neil Gaiman reading of Retirement. I know there's some kind of relationship there that some something like Harvey goes to see or Odin goes to see Hell uh, to beg for the release of his son. Hmm. and she doesn't want to let him go because of reasons, and I'm not sure what those reasons are. <laughs> you, you keep talking, everyone's... I'll hit up Wikipedia. It says um, here, right, um, every... the prose edit details that Hel rules over vast mansions with many servants in her underworld realm and plays a key role in the attempted resurrection of the god Baldur. So, yeah, there's a close link there somewhere. Yeah, um, she says that they can have her balder back if everybody weeps for yeah balder. so she's the one who set that condition yeah. uh, but, but loki refused and that's why i wonder like what is their relationship is she helping him somehow or do they have like a contentious relationship it's it's weird because now i remember in norse myths loki doesn't actually refuse to cry instead he shapes this into i think it's a giant in a cliff and everyone goes, and the giant she refuses to weep for Balder, and everyone gets angry. But it's not till Thor realizes, hang on a minute, we don't recognize that person. We think that was Loki. So I think Hell set the conditions. Now I remember, but Loki did them on his own whim. So I don't think Loki and his daughter knew anything were connected. But I could be wrong. It's it's just been a bit disappointing that we 
at least we in the materials we've seen so far of mm. the DLC, we haven't seen her. I feel like if she was a major character, like a boss, <laughs> that we would see her. So I have the feeling that she's probably not going to appear in the DLC, which would be disappointing. You know, whilst Declan was speaking, my mind was going down the same route, Six Keys, but I came to the other opposite conclusion. I thought, hang on a minute, it's a teaser trailer. They've shown us Havi, who we already is a well-established character from from the, the mythological arcs and, and, you know, the sort of Eivor's own internal memory corridors or whatever you want to call it. But maybe they aren't showing it. I mean, it would make sense for them not to show us everything. So don't show us hell. Don't show us. Um, oh, they do show us Balder, don't they, briefly uh, in his prison. Um, but is it really Balder? Ah, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How how many layers of Inception do we uh, do we descend into? Right, in because this, uh... the Isu language text that uh, acts as the Animus translator said something like, "Will you save your true children in this place?" Ooh. So Ooh. is he going to like have a some kind of choice maybe like choosing like does he have to figure out if it's really his son and save the real son or is it maybe oh an God. illusion of some kind? Oh God, sorry, I think you just blow my mind that six keys. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> right, bear with me. I'm on. relying on Norse Sh knowledge. Share with us some Norse six knowledge. Six keys. I'm like mind blown here. Thank you. <laughs> my brain hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so you run about tricking. Um, in the myths, um, the Aesir turned Valley into a wolf, who then attacked and killed Nar Narifi, who is Valley is Loki's oldest son, the Sigmund, and Narifi is his youngest. And that would mean Fenrir is a wolf, and Valley is also a wolf. So which one is your true children child? Fenrir or Valley because Valley is also a son of the god Odin and the giantess Rondor, Rindor in some tellings of Norse myths so Valley could act as an adoptive child for Loki and um, what was his wife called I've just, I've just had it up um, I always Sigmund. forget to <laughs> so what if as you've just said then Sixty said Valley could be an adopted child between uh, Loki and Signy, and Wolf is n and Valley's now transferred as Wolf, so he has to choose his real son, Fenrir, the Wolf, or his adopted son, Valley, who is also a Wolf. Can you choose your true child? Interesting. Please don't. This is going to hurt my head if this is the case. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would cry. But, but I'm, you know, my first thought when, or like, the speculation that I'm having at the moment is, um, what if, you know, we we saw what who we assumed was Baldur in the trailer, but we didn't see his face. Like yeah. it was hidden for a reason. I think so. You know, it could be just that they don't want to reveal it at this stage to kind of build up the hype. Or it could be, you know, a hint towards maybe it's the person that we saw. Maybe it's actually someone else who transformed himself to look like his son. Who do we know who's a shapeshifter? Oh, let me think. <laughs> that was that was exactly the th as soon as you said that six keys. Maybe it's someone who's transformed himself or or their herself <laughs> to look like Balder. My first thought was, yep. I know who that could be, and that would be great. <laughs> Trick Havi into freeing the wrong person. Yeah, you yeah. know, um, like lure him to a yeah, trap somehow. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, maybe we could summarize just just to return briefly uh, to the script. Um, Basim or Basim as Loki, he's been through some shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> both both in his time as an Isu and his time uh, since then. Um, I like I said, I, I judged him pretty harshly when I played the game probably too harshly and i'm definitely seeing more of the the gray not so black and white on his um his character i don't judge him so harshly for uh, doing some of the things he did um but yeah it'll be very interesting to see what's revealed in the in upcoming trailers or gameplay snippets and will will there be more after this or will this be the only expansion that explores this mythology there's certainly plenty of stories they could tell 
that are all connected to to Havi and uh, Loki and and the rest of the uh, the Norse gods. There's enough gods to go around, that's for sure. <laughs> Declan mentioned earlier about um, you know that the gods have treated Loki with disrespect mm. in the myths. Like he's, I think they sort of see him as you know. Um, maybe lower class, a bit crass. Um, you know, obviously they, they call him a trickster, so they don't trust him. Um, but I, I think it's, it tells a lot about the Isu society. I think we, we can like, just from this single character, we can see a lot of elements that I think make up the Norse Isu society. You know, we don't know if it's all of the Isu or just like this s small segment of them. But um, mm. we see that you know he's half Jotun. He's they they see him as an outsider. They don't they don't trust him because of that. Like partly because of that at least. And Tyr also makes this comment about Freya, you know, for being Vanir. So there's like we kind of get this hint that the the Isu are pretty racist. I was about to say exactly that. They're not exactly a, an enlightened. Uh... Uh, group of people are they yeah <laughs> yeah like they, they seem to have this like deep sense of loyalty to your own kin mm. and we see that also in you know both in the Aesir and Juno and Loki like it's they're they're all about family yeah like like Juno is also about like all she cares about is is bringing her husband back and she has like this deep hatred of humans. Like it's been centuries since all of the injustices that happened to the Isu have passed and she still harbors this hatred. So they're like, um, they hold grudges for a very, very long time. And it's the same for Loki. Like he obviously, he also harbored hatred for Javi all this time. Yeah. for centuries and like he's been plotting this whole time and he also cares only about his own family like he doesn't even form as deep of a connection with someone like Hytham so it's um something that we we can see like these elements of the whole society reflected in his character and it's sort of like he's he's an outsider so he gets um treated with distrust and lack of respect and maybe he's maybe it's another self-fulfilling prophecy which is what the whole game is about it's like he he already knows he's gonna get treated like shit anyway so fine why not lean into it why not become the trickster that they already think he is absolutely yeah and then just use it to your advantage get take what you could get what you can from each situation yeah yeah one thought i've got then so Bassin, uh, I, I forget the exact year and the chronology of, of the historical part of um, Valhalla story. It's, it's around the 880s or 870s, isn't it? So Bassim is, well, defeated, should we say, by Eivor and, and becomes attached to Yggdrasil. And he then spends 1,200 years. My maths is not so good. 1,100, 1,200 years in the supercomputer um, running calculations. Um, I wonder how much of what is happening now when he was reanimated, he already knows what's going to happen because he's run all of the predictions. Now, of course, from a storytelling point of view, if, if you're, if one of your most interesting sort of protagonists knows exactly how it's all going to play out, <laughs> yeah. then that's not so exciting for us as players because, well, everything will just be to, to Basim's design, but it, it would be interesting to see, to see how they use how do the writers use his time in Yggdrasil? Or do they just ignore it? Um, and he obviously, he doesn't know everything because mm. he failed to predict who Eivor really was. True. True. So there were some calculations that he got right, um, but we don't know what exactly it is that he predicted. Mm. He, he must point. have had some kind of plan like, get from point a to point b but there were all there were also moments of surprise along the way like he also didn't foresee that sigurd would get captured by fulke because we saw like there was this moment of you know like blue screening where he was like oh my god what am i gonna do now 
I didn't expect this at all. <laughs> Hang on, but he he wouldn't have known that then because he hadn't yet connected to Yggdrasil. No, 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 but I mean, like, when he was still Loki, that he had these calculations that he Ah, knew would get him to reunite with his wife. Mm. Mm. So he saw maybe the broad... He probably also didn't know that he was going to get thrown all the way to modern day Iraq or wherever he was born. <laughs> you know? Do you know, that is that is the downside. Sorry, Declan, I know you want to speak, but I'll make one very quick point. That is the downside of the whole uh, let's embed our DNA or our consciousness across the whole of humanity. What happens if you get reanimated on the far side of the planet and you haven't developed long distance, you know, oceanic travel yet? <laughs> you know, you <laughs> right? are, you've got to just wait. I mean, obviously, we're, we're messing around a little bit here, but. You know, you are the, the the odds of awakening in the right geographic location at the right technological level to reunite and the right with... time. Yeah, like, yeah. Because uh, what's his face? Um, Heimdaller was born too early. Uh, the you you find oh. these pages of the Rigso, uh, Rigsoguru, uh, like a legend talking about this person who did all of the, all these great things, and he was like hailed as a leader. But that was Heimdaller reborn, but he was reborn too early. He didn't get to reunite with all his buddies. Bloody, so I, I completely missed that the, those pages were about him. Uh, Declan, yeah. please, you, you've had your hand up for ages. Go ahead, mate. Um, to be honest, I, I still think the sage mechanics that they usually did was the dumbest thing they would do, you know. Let's cheat death, but have no idea how it's going to work, is essentially <laughs> what they did. Like, I want to cheat death. I'm going to wake up in 100 years. Oh, wait, it doesn't work like that. I'll see you in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, think about how how close to how close to death Eivor came in her mm. childhood when she was, like, nine years old. Mm. She could have died to that wolf, and that would have been the end of Odin. Yep. So, yep. um, the point there I is, want to... Do you know, I'm sorry, I just want to say very quickly, there, there is a phrase in English which um, is, I think is quite useful for this situation. It's very crude, but I'm going to say it anyway. The, the whole sage thing feels like the, the phrase, if you throw enough shit at the wall, some of it will stick. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, was the situation. They were like just super desperate. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We just have to go for it, guys, and see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Declan. I'm sorry. For YOLO. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's something that interesting I wanted to bring up, and I know it's kind of off topic with Bastion himself. You know, I'm still assuming we're going to be talking about this nice hot man called Bastion, but we kind of go off and topic something deeper. Is it possible then that, and I'm probably going to get some complaints about this, but that the simulations themselves are sentient? Sounds stupid, I know, but maybe the simulations themselves only willingly allow people to see so much. It's why no matter how many time, much time you spend with the reader, as well as Basim did, you'll never see beyond a certain point because the simulations refuse to show you that much because no man deserves that much knowledge. So maybe Basim doesn't know everything because the reader chose to only show him what he needs to know, not what he wants to know, if that makes sense. That is so... That's an interesting question. So the reader is Desmond, who at the point that the games at modern day games events take place, I guess I guess it's around release time, isn't it? So it's around the end of 2020. So Desmond's been in the machine for or in the gray for eight years. We don't know if he was in the same part of the gray as Basim's consciousness. Um, did they meet? Did they chat? You know, did they drink tea and talk about you know, stuff, life, the I universe, think, I think everything. they did at least meet because Basim says something like, uh, I am not alone in this place. Not always. Uh, there is someone Ooh. who helps me. Wow. Oh, I like that. But it's Maybe. interesting to, to imagine how exactly did he appear to Desmond? Like, did he maybe assume the guise of someone from his previous life, someone he would trust? to sort of mess with his head or did he just you know say oh don't worry about me i'm just a stranger <laughs> looking at whatever it is you do just ignore me i'll just be over here looking my immediate thought was he would appear as the nornir but basim isn't actually basim the the human was not a norse he was uh actually where was he from i know that he met sigurd in constantinople but 
He must be from. Was he from? I don't remember. Bombay, Iraq, because his father was involved in the Library of Baghdad. So yeah, uh, I think he was. Um, he was stationed in Baghdad at one point as a mentor, mm. but I'm not mm. sure if he was if he was born there. Well, that's a, I need. I'm going to quickly look that up whilst we carry on talking because. I, I had Maybe. in my notes that I'm assuming he was part of the Levantine Assassins, but the Levantine Assassins didn't exist then, I guess, until the no, until Altair's or until um, Al Nualim's time. So yeah, actually, I'm not sure what what part he was part of. So yeah, Maybe the next game we'll explore it because is it possible that we may now be able to have a game where we see Isu life because we now have someone who has Isu memories, so the animus should be able to go back there and. At the same time, see Basim's life. Are so you suggesting we have a game set in a sort of a, a medieval city where we follow the, the life of a hidden one, doing like assassination missions and stuff? <laughs> yes, but um, but okay, I am literally going to get shot. <laughs> I, mean, I sense I, some saltiness. <laughs> I, okay, I, I am in full. Start. Look, I've, I'm off the back of like six months of playing Unity and then replaying Syndicate, and I've had an absolutely great time in a city, you know, doing assassinations and throwing smoke bombs and other things and cover assassinations and being sneaky. And while I love the open world games, and I've spoken at length on this show about how much I enjoyed the open world games, there's just something about a big city full of, well, not even a big city, even even um, the very small area you get to play in um, when you do the Lydia Fry story, which is just around Tower Bridge in London. It's a tiny area. It's it's fantastic to have that little dense area full of people and yeah. So I'm not I'm not exactly salty, but I, I, I would. Look, I, I'm going to be honest. I just want a Unity update. Give me, give me 4K. <laughs> fix a few of the little bugs. Give me photo mode, and I'm happy. You know, that's all I want. <laughs> to be honest, whatever I'll... Infinite turns out to be, I feel like that would be a perfect platform to tell these smaller stories in mm. smaller adv- environments. Mm. So maybe there we could have. I don't know, I'm just throwing the idea out there. Maybe yep. we could have a little game about Basim? I would like that. Well, I had an <laughs> idea about that. And I think it's one that will please all fans, including myself. But maybe a open world style, but small in Valhalla, Basim story. Let's see is, But very linear, condensed, old Assassin's Creed style maps hidden behind... Um, truth videos but instead of videos do ac freestyle where you could you know do missions in the modern day but they're actually isu missions for loki and see what loki was up to during the times because if basim straps himself in an animus surely be able to see both memories of him and loki so wouldn't it be cool to have a little game where you got basim doing basim stuff and then you go to like a glyph or something that's hidden and you just play a very small linear parkour style map as Loki running through high-tech sci-fi Isu land. That would be badass. I'd, I'd be up for a bit of modern day uh, stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. Proper parkour. I, I really, I, I've heard mixed opinions on, on the modern day stuff in AC3, but I really enjoyed it. I thought the MMA fight was awesome. Um, I know the parkour wasn't massively challenging, but I really enjoyed it and revisiting, you know, um, the uh, the Abstergo offices in Rome. Um, I thought all that was fantastic, so I'd be up for that, definitely. The only problem with modern day stuff, why we haven't seen so much of it, I think, is because they have to create new assets for it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think that, that was like, it made AC3 special in a way, but uh, I think that's the reason why we haven't seen it afterwards. Mm. They, um, Obviously, I would love it, but yeah, I, I, I mean, just just an idea. If, if anyone from Ubisoft is listening, then um, the the Assassin's Creed developers just need to pick up the phone to the Watchdogs team and borrow their <laughs> modern day assets, and boom, there you go, modern day London, ready to go. Watch Dogs. <laughs> I, I mean, I've not played Watchdogs Legion. I've watched some some gameplay on YouTube. It looks fantastic. It really does. What a game! You know, there, there's all your assets, ready to go. <laughs> I'm not sure. Do they even use the same engine? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm being really sarcastic, or not sarcastic, <laughs> but yeah, I have no idea how complex that is, and I'm not sure if they both use Anvil or not, but uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> the uh, the creativity is there, isn't it? Even if the, the sort of underlying tech is uh, totally different. But yeah, I get that there's a cost for all of that, but uh, anyway. 
To be honest, I just want some nice little missions like AC3 where you could just do some little fun stuff in modern day, but even if I'm, I'm being very critical here, and um, even if, and I wouldn't mind it for Infinity because Infinity is like um, live service so they could have little ones, even if hypothetically they give us a little Bassam game with no modern day, more like Unity style, which is like cutscenes, and put more assets into East two cities that we can explore through Basim's Loki memories. And I I wouldn't be too upset about that because I know modern day is important and I love modern day even though it's not as big as it used to be. But I would love like them to tweak things or even take some RPG elements out and put the resources you put into the RPG elements into a little bit of modern day, even if it's just one campaign, one linear map at the very end of the game. It's just something I don't I don't mind. I'm not too picky. <laughs> yeah, I just I just want them to progress the modern day story, honestly. Just like do something with it, please. Well, I mean, to to come back to the topic of Bassid, aren't we in a really interesting place right now? You know. Yeah. Um, That's why I like, hope they don't squander it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um the like we've been in a very interesting place before, and then they moved it all to comics. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so I, I've I've heard that comment many times, right? Because <laughs> you know you you've got all Juno being built up from AC three. She's there in actually is she present in Black Flag? She's there in Rogue. Um, yeah, of course she's Black present Flag in Black also, Flag. She's yeah. she's in the vault or in the data center, isn't yeah. she? Underneath. Yeah, and so, then all she does is basically say, "Now is not the time." Yeah. Why not? What do you mean? Why? Oh, because we're going to make another game, damn it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's built up. And again, this is something that I missed when I played uh, Syndicate for the first time last year. I never did the World War One rift. I just thought, well, that's like a DLC or something. I'll come back to it. Little did I realize Juno is there again telling her story and it's nearly ready and it's nearly ready. And, and again, it's like, uh, yeah. but now is not the time. I'm just here to <laughs> speak a few lines and uh, yep. see you next game. Yep. I just love to know why. And then we it, never did. Yeah. Why was it? Who made the decision? Let's tell that. Let's finish that story in a comic. I don't know. <laughs> Bizarre. I, I think personally, it was too hard to finish Juno's. Like, if they tried to finish Juno's arc in the games the way they did in the comics, I think it would be really confusing. You know, first instruments of the first world making an appearance in one game. And I don't know. It's kind of weird. I think. By Syndicate, everyone was complaining about the modern day and that the series needed a revitalization. So I think kind of got to the point where it was, we need to revitalize. Something's <laughs> going to have to go. But the modern <laughs> bye day bye, Juno. Yeah, but why would what? you, like, why Six. does the thing that has to go, why does it have to be, like, one of the biggest elements of the series? Mm. I, to mm. be honest, I played Origins and I love Origins to pieces. But when Juno did not appear in, at the end of Origins, I was like, where the hell is she gone? Right. So I went to Google. It was like in a comic. I was like, AC has comics. Where do I find these? <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. Where do I get these? Brilliant. And then, the like bathroom. for years, for years later, I still saw people on YouTube like, so hey, whatever happened to Juno? You know, where I haven't seen her in a few years, and people saying, oh, they moved her to comics, and exactly that reaction. Like there were comics. <laughs> Oh dear. I didn't even know let's, there was books at one let, point. <laughs> <laughs> let, let's hope that Basim's story is not continued in a comic or a book or some <laughs> other media. You know, with all due respect to people who read comics and, and whatever, that's fine. But I kind of want, I want my fingers on the WASD key or on the controller. I want to be in Or charge. at least not only. Because yes, that's the that, thing. That's like, a you, better you way of saying it. You can have both. Like comics and novels and all that stuff that they can be used to expand the modern day like show us what sean and rebecca were up to in between the years that we didn't see them uh but don't just yeet them into the comics and forget about them in the games that's a good point so i'm trying to think back so sean and rebecca not present in odyssey's modern day they weren't present in origins even as voices were they i don't think not that I recall. Because we've got Layla, and she's on the, on the phone or on the radio to Deanna Geary, I think regularly. But I don't. I know. I know that right at the end, the assassins turn up to to sort of save Layla from 
her employers or former employers. Um, but I don't think it's Sean and Rebecca. So they, they, they were gone for quite a few years, weren't they? Yeah. Um, from the story. And um, the weird thing is Sean did show up in the audio play um, Assassin's Creed Gold. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Some... Let me just do a Declan here. Audio play? <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually really cool. You should listen to it. It's on Audible. Okay. All right. Um, which, it, which had, uh, like, it also had Gavin Banks from Initiates, who's also appeared in the uh, modern day lore for years. Um, but yeah, Sean was in that story as like some sort of AI companion for some reason. Okay. And I, I was confused the whole time about like, why did the assassins do this? Because he, he's still alive. At first I was like, what, he died? But no, apparently he's he's just alive and he's just, he made an AI out of himself for some reason. I don't know. Like a sort of assassin Jarvis or something. Yeah, on. it was almost like like they just <laughs> they just wanted that nod in there for fans. Like, oh, hey, look, it's the person you, you guys like a lot. Let's just <laughs> have him voice, you know, let him, let him do a voice part here, but make it so that it doesn't really make sense anyway. Okay. <laughs> uh, I shall look. Uh, you can get a free trial to Audible. I always get this, every podcast in the world, apart from this one, seems to have Audible adverts. So I'm sure I can get a 30 yeah, day free uh, trial. Otherwise, it's it's re- it's pretty nice. Yeah. I, w- I would recommend it. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Go on, Declan, mate. Um, I may have. I know this is really off topic, but a very stupid theory of what Rebecca and Sean are up to and why he may be in the AI. So it's off topic, I know, and it's probably silly, but I really believe since the um, Desmond storyline that Rebecca and Sean and Desmond and Lydia are the only characters to ever come in contact with Isu. So I believe William Miles has created a team, which is Rebecca and Sean, to deal with Isu only stuff, which is why they're now back in Valhalla because of Layla and the staff. It's as important, and I don't think they're available in Odyssey, because I think my theory would work better if they were in Odyssey. But I think he's got an AI com- AI to help other teams, because yeah, you know how cocky he is in Assassin's Creed 2 about, like, I do other stuff, you know, I'm not just a data researcher. <laughs> <laughs> he's so big-headed. I could see him being so vital to the franchise that William Miles, who's the head, is using Sean as an asset to all team members while keeping him away on secret projects it's totally backwards but i really think that's why moving forward we'll only ever see bastion with rebecca and sean because i think they're now isu what's the word like imagine the black is it black cross that um abstergo has yeah yeah imagine the black cross but for isu stuff in assassin form and that's what rebecca and sean are heading up i know Probably a silly idea, but <laughs> I'm full of them. I mean, it could work as a theory, yeah. Like the reason, as an explanation for why why they would have an AI of Sean. Like, so he can be in sort of, in a way, multiple places at the same time mm. and helping other teams. But Like a snarky British version of Alexa. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, tell me something annoying. Okay. <laughs> I would pay for that. I would definitely pay to would you have Imagine Sean. that as an Alexa skill, you get Sean's voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, sorry. We, we, need, yeah. we need a Sean GPS. Oh my God, that would be brilliant. I mean, surely Danny Wallace would you be really happy to You failed to make his... a right, just as I suggested, <laughs> you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, we should probably anyway, return uh... fleetingly to the script. <laughs> Um, which we don't have, as anyone listening may have guessed. There is, there's no real script. There is no script. No. Did you, um, when when Basim was, uh, was introduced and then they travelled to England, what was your kind of reaction to him as a character early on anyway? Um, Six Keys, were you cautious? Were you interested? Were you um, distrusting of him? Uh, I didn't really know what to think, which I think was the the idea. We kind of felt like Eivor, in a way. Like, we're used to trusting Hidden Ones or Assassins from the start. Yeah. But I think we all kind of maybe had the same feeling as Eivor did, that, like, there's something shady about this guy. (laughs) So that's what I was kind of... I was, like, waiting for 
that moment where he would betray us. But then the campfire scene happened and, you know, he sort of, you know, he became our friend in that moment. And yeah. I was like, oh, you know, maybe I've been wrong about this the whole time. And then, you know, <laughs> of course, in the end, it all explodes. But So I'm, I'm actually forgetting, I've got a gap in my knowledge. So the campfire scene is the Kent arc. I don't remember the names of all the arcs, but then... Me neither. <laughs> Remind me. So, what if you if you remember what happens between the Kent arc and that scene, and the return to Norway when he he appears in Yggdrasil? You know, he's he's followed Sigurd and Eivor home, and then he appears. Is there more contact? Do we see him kind of giving in to his sage personality, or does he kind of just disappear for a while? Uh, he sort of takes a step back from the action like mm. he mostly just hangs out in Ravensdorp, leaning against various surfaces ah yes back to leaning. <laughs> gotcha uh but I, I don't know if it also depends on what order you do the arcs in because i'm not sure how much freedom there is in that like if you can go straight you know through the whole sigurd arc and then mm. to norway or do you have to like go through them in a certain order. I don't remember that exactly. No, there's a few times when you can choose which arc you do next, yeah. isn't there? And I just tended to pick the southernmost of the choices first. So I was gradually working my way south to north. It's, it's grim up north. Sorry, Declan, but you know, you don't want to go up north. Um, I, I mostly went by level. Okay, level gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't remember really the his personal story like you said, after that campfire scene. Um, and then he reappears. In, There's not uh, really... We don't really get hints about, you know, him changing or anything like that. Mm, uh, it's mm. um, it's more like when they start their search together for Sigurd. Um, I forget where it is, but they, they meet up at the monastery. Um, and that's sort of, I think, where... Like they go to to uh, Basim wants to introduce this priest to Eivor or this bishop who can maybe help them save Sigurd in some way uh, by creating an alliance. And uh, I think that's the moment when they first start having like slightly more friendlier talks with each other and learning about each other more. Mm. Um, and that leads up to the campfire scene eventually. And after that, they're sort of like they're just friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. but then after they save Sigurd, uh, he just, he, he seems kind of disappointed for some reason, um, when Sigurd is back at the, at the longhouse and he has like fully embraced the, you know, his tear personality. Like he believes he's a God and that, you know, he, he has this argument with Eivor. He doesn't trust her anymore. And that like really messes with her. Mm. Um, but Basim is sort of like uh, at that moment when he wits when he witnesses this fight between them, he he says something like, "You know, I don't really feel like celebrating. I'm like feeling kind of melancholy at this moment." And they never really explain why, but I feel like at that moment, maybe he, maybe that's the moment when he somehow realizes this is actually not who I was looking for. Odin That's is somewhere what I else. Was wondering. Yeah, because yeah. doesn't he think that Sigurd is Odin? Yeah, but maybe he recognizes that it's actually, you know, I don't know if he recognizes that it's Tyr specifically. Yeah. But but he senses, you know, oh, this is not who I was after. He is somewhere else. I have no idea what to do now. And that's why he's depressed. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it? And again, this is this is my lack of I mean, I haven't played through the main... I've only played the main story once and I haven't gone back to watch cutscenes, so I, I, my memory isn't great. What is the clue that tips him off that it's Eivor? Does it come right at the end when they are all back in Yggdrasil? I don't think we know. Okay. Like, I I don't think we see that moment specifically. Mm. It's... Mm. He just decides to follow them. Maybe, maybe he already suspected when he started to hear about, you know, Sigurd's planning to go to Norway. Maybe we, maybe he already sensed something about, you know, there's something off here. Why would they go together? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've 
I was just going to say, sorry, James. I've been wondering, when he spent time hanging around Raven's for, what if he ratched through the whole clan looking for clues and answers, you know, where he should go next? What if he stumbled on Valka's hut? And maybe Valka's made notes about uh, um, Eivor's premonitions, you know, what she's been saying, you know, the Great Betrayal, the potions she's meant to have been, you know, using. And he kind of gets a hint that there's something off about Eivor, you know, doesn't know what it really is. Because as an assassin, he would be trained to look for clues, information. Yeah. And if he's left alone, and we know Hyphen has taken a greater interest in Eivor, so... There is a possibility that Hyphen knows something, you know, just about her personality, and maybe it's just something she said or did that has, like, a body language or a a way she said it that reminds him of Odin, and he's like, hmm, this is fishy. It could be a long stretch, but maybe he's just... I I can see that. (laughs) Snooping at potions. He wants some mushroom tea. That's what it is. That's the neatest... (laughs) Which and, and the simplest and therefore the best answer. You know, he <laughs> he's kicking around Ravensthorpe. He's a bit fed up. You know, he asks Valka for a pick me up. She she uh, brews him some special mushroom tea, and he he regresses and into you know sees a similar kind of um, reconstruction of of his past life as Avor did, and, and the pieces fall into place, or maybe don't fall into place, but it makes him think. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's I can't see her neck for the scar because of the wolf's um, yeah. jaw marks. You know, this could be it. Um, or maybe it's that, again, this is, again, my, my lack of memory, but maybe he sees something in Eivor's personality, her kind of devotion to her. I don't know, Havi's a tricky character. I, I came away from the game thinking that Havi was basically a bit of a prick. But, <laughs> yeah, not just maybe, a bit. maybe... Well, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to be balanced, but yeah, um, maybe he sees a certain devotion that Avil has to her family and to her clan that Havi had. But Havi always struck me as kind of selfish, so maybe that theory is rubbish and just ignore it. Yeah, uh, that's something that I've I've also thought. Uh, like, there's there's a bit I forget again which arc, but like they basically go on an adventure, and that's also something from the myths um, that. Like Javi and Loki would sometimes go on these adventures together, even though in some myths they are supposed to be kind of not enemies, but like not like each other. But then you also have myths where they just sort of go on an adventure and like a like a body comedy, you know. <laughs> so it's like that's another reflection of the of the myths. I think that mm. you have these kind of like sometimes comedic moments where they like, uh, you know, they have to infiltrate a monastery or something and Eivor catches someone's attention and they get detected and then Basim makes like some kind of sarcastic comment like, oh, I thought we were going to do this the quiet way, but I guess, you know, <laughs> whatever. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's that's a reflection of the mythology that they sort of, that's that's another part of their friendship in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm now trying to think other, there's, a, there's only three arcs that I can remember where they, spend time together Oxenafordshire where they meet Fulke um Kent which is the the campfire scene and then is it I, I can't remember in the game if it's called Sussex or Sussex Sussex I think. right and I think that's the arc where they actually find Sigurd in the in the the vault of the church yeah. or the vault of the monastery isn't it so are there any other arcs where they actually spend time together that's I like I don't it. remember I just remember like scenes mm. but i don't remember okay. if they're all from the same segments or the same sequences or if they're like for separate ones but uh, yeah they do have some moments where they like banter back and forth uh Eivor asks questions like you know what is it like to be a hidden one and all that stuff and um uh, you know just these these sort of intimate moments where they learn from each other and she realizes may- maybe there's more to him than I first thought. Like she's been distrusting him this whole, this whole time because all she ever saw was this shady guy hanging around her brother, you know, sort of taking him away from her. And that's why she was so bitter the whole time. But then she starts to learn more about him and figures out like, okay, he actually seems to care about Sigurd for whatever reason. And we have we share the same goal. So... We have to spend time together searching for him anyway, so why not, you know, why not be friendly? <laughs> yeah, 
Mm. And maybe that's where she, or maybe that's where he recognizes certain elements of his former friendship with Javi because they used to be friends before they became enemies. Ah. Uh. That's, that's, the, that's the thing, like, what I said earlier is that, um, like, in this single character, you kind of have, you can see the themes that the whole game is trying to reflect, like, it's, it's history repeating itself, and, like, always, always, like, they, even, in, in the mythology, uh, you know, they used to be friends, and then ra that relationship sours. And then they get reborn as two different people who could, in theory, repair that relationship. But because of who they are, because of their personalities being so, so different, and because, the, or at least Loki can't let, let go of his grudge against Javi, it's doomed again to fail. Like history is again repeating itself because he can't change. And that's what makes him different from Eivor because Eivor chooses to reject Odin. She chooses to change. Mm. But Loki, like, he, he has fully embraced who he is and he just refuses to let that anger go. It's interesting as you were talking and describing his his decision to or his yeah his choice not to forgive and not to forget even after seventy seven thousand years. Um, it makes me wonder if Fenrir and uh, his other children, um, Hel and Jormungandr, didn't survive. Um, because if they had have survived, perhaps his motivation uh, survived um, the terrible catastrophe. I mean, um, would his motivation be? removed his motivation or would he always want revenge i mean he was treated fairly horribly i don't blame him but um yeah yeah and I've he goes a... and he goes too far obviously like that's what makes him he's not a like a hero heroic character no like no. he's he, he's i wouldn't call him a villain i would i would say maybe anti-hero or or antagonist but i i wouldn't describe him as a villain necessarily because Javi was a prick, <laughs> like you said. Yeah, like they're they're yeah. both they're both <laughs> villains and both <laughs> heroes in their own stories. They've both been they feel like they've been wronged somehow. And it's just a matter of do you do you choose to change based on learning? Like Eivor learns that she doesn't actually want glory and fame and fortune. She she wants family. So that's why, yeah. she, like, she, the whole game, the whole story is about her learning all these new things that she never learned as Javi. And when the time comes to choose, she's like, no, I have all this new experience, uh, all these new friends, new family, and I want to keep that. And I reject who I was before. That's an interesting theory. Um, one thing I just want to quickly bring up before James moves on to another point I think he's got is, <clears throat> I know I'm badgering on too much about mythology and I apologise, but when James mentioned, you know, if uh, Yorin didn't survive, would he still have that motivation revenge? Well, what if there's another angle that's not revenge that he, he could have followed? Because in the mythology, Loki was adopted by Odin, and I can't remember ever seeing the reasons behind why Loki, Odin took in Loki. You know, he's not an Aesir, he's a giant, and he's a Jartmeninger, so he's a different race completely, but he took him in. And in the very end, when everyone is, shuns Loki for what he's done with Balder, he walks up to Odin and said, you know, you promised, and you give your word, which is law, that I'm always welcome at your tables. So he can sit down drinking if everyone's, you know, shuns him, he's still protected by Odin, so there's always that angle that even if Odin didn't betray his children, all five of them, as I'm going to say, why did Odin attach himself so close to Loki, you know? What is the Isu connection to, 
to why Odin and Loki were so close and why essentially Odin protected Loki from everyone else, even though yeah. his actions was kind of a bit on the nose at times. You know, he... And he, and he uh, had this whole blood oath, you know, that he promised that he would never spill his blood, like, no matter how bad things got between them, how much he annoyed him, that he he was literally bound by this this promise that he made to Loki. And Loki even taunts him with it. So it's interesting to think, like, what is it that made them so close originally? What happened between them that made Javi really trust this person and Loki trust Javi? I think this opens a whole dynamic that Basim is incredibly, and as I, you know, I suggested when I put on the little tweet to put him on this episode, why Basim himself is one of the most important characters in Assassin's Creed because he's not a cardboard of this is my personality, stick with it. He has a fluid personality that could change because he could have his own Basim personality before he, you know, was a sage reborn. He could have Loki's personality, he could, he could have both. But at the same time, he has a life before being reborn as a sage, but a life as Loki himself, and so much stories to tell through Odin, through himself, that he's kind of an essential figure for Assassin's Creed moving forward, for unique story points in both Assassin's story and Isu. I mean, like, can think... I can I just say how much again, like, I love that he represents the themes of the whole game just because, like, by virtue of being a hidden one, because he's a shapeshifter, and the hidden ones are basically, you know, they have to be shapeshifters too with social stealth. They have to adapt to every situation. Mm. They have to hide in plain sight, which is what he does. And one detail that I'll always love is that, you know, the what's it called, like uh, the, the clasp or the, the metal piece on his cape uh, shows all three of his children. It's like does the equivalent. It? It, it does. What? Yes. That's amazing. Yes, it has a carving of uh, uh, a snake, a wolf, and like a kind of grotesque woman. Oh, that's cool. Like, yeah, so it's like it's, he's literally hiding urgently. in plain sight. My God. Oh, it does. Yeah, like over his, uh, what would it be? Over his right right chest. Yeah, where yeah. is um, his Yeah, over... I don't know what you call it in English. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, like a buckle or a... My God, yeah, it's right there. Yeah. I mean, now I'm thinking... And, what, and you don't realize it until them... after. Yeah. Look at this. <laughs> All right, there we go. Mind blown. Roll credits. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Any other any other details you spotted? Because um, I would never have noticed that unless you'd said it. Uh, I did notice. I don't know if it's um, anything important, but uh, uh, one of the um, like pouches that he wears on his belt is mm. like instead of a button. To close it, uh, there is like a some kind of animal claw or a tooth, and it could be like a wolf's tooth or may Oof. maybe like that's my theory. <laughs> so I don't know. It could be just like maybe maybe that's what the Norse did, or you know, people in that time period. Maybe that was just normal for them. I don't know, yeah, but yeah. I like to think that it is <laughs> another reference of some sort. Understood. I'll tell you one thing. I'm looking at his uh, the the character art uh, for him right now as you're describing his clasp and so on and with with the peaked hood and the graying beard which is not really quite how he looks in the game but in the character yeah. art could be just, just lighting also yeah yeah he doesn't half remind me of of older Ezio in revelations <laughs> with the graying beard and the beaked hood it really does i mean i know it's just a gray beard and lots of people have gray beards but it does remind me very strongly of uh, of older Ezio. anyway some people did have the theory before release uh that maybe that was deliberate to kind of make us subconsciously trust this character. Ah, nice. Create this whole, because there, there were obviously more revelations, uh, nods in the release trailer. Like it was very similar in some ways to the, 
the trailer for Revelations. Understood. So maybe that could have been another hint, like sort of, hey, you know, this guy kind of looks like someone you used to trust, so trust him as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those tricksy writers, hey? <laughs> Can I ask you both a silly question? Uh, did you punch Basim? Six keys? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I Fair also enough. drove over him with a carriage. You drove what? <laughs> or not a not a carriage? Um, uh, what do you call it? A battering ram. <laughs> Hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hang on a minute. How? Oh, yes, they were, they take part in a siege, don't they? <laughs> yes, and he got in the way. Okay, he was marching in front of the door, you know, posing with his sword like a cool guy. And, <laughs> he, sl he slings and, it over his shoulder, doesn't he? And I was like, <laughs> move out of the way, please. And he just wouldn't. So I was like. Okay, sorry. <laughs> hey, a girl's got a batter, so yep, you're out, out of the way, mate. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's I great. hope what about... he learned his lesson. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Declan? Did you punch Basim? Oh, I punched him twice. Um, twice? <laughs> Hang on, when's punch... there a second prompt? Um, well, no, I punched him, and then I turned the game off. <laughs> Went to get a drink, turned the game back on, forgot to save, and I was at that checkpoint, so I got to punch him again. <laughs> because... I was really conscious about my decision making, so I was planning in my head if a punch was going to happen. And I kind of figured, he's being a dick. I don't care if I <laughs> the game ended wrong. Just punch him in the nose. You know, just shut up a second, please. And it was the only point in the very end game where Sigurd was just like, not happy with me. And I was like, well, I did everything <laughs> for you. You know, I didn't flirt with Ranvi. I didn't do anything. I was a good boy, but I had to punch Bassin. <laughs> and I will do it again. Even though I like the character. I will punch him again. I think next time I'll punch him. When, when New Game Plus is available and I can replay the story, I'm going to give him a good punch. I didn't punch him in my playthrough. I figured it's much I'd... more satisfying, I feel like, from a storytelling point of view, if you punch him. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Yeah. I think if Sigurd just, I, I, I just like so role-playing Eivor in that moment. <laughs> mm, yeah. I mean, he was he was talking a load of crap, wasn't he, about gods and history. <laughs> yeah, and, you and, know, know, really leading, like, obviously constantly whispering things in her brother's ear and mm. like messing up all mm. their plans that they agreed upon. And she would just have been so pissed at that point. <laughs> yeah. You're not wrong. Um, and, you know, you make, so that, that's a, that story, that part of the story is when you're following or, or looking for Fulke, who is a member of the order of the ancients. And, and she's trying, she's kind of got the same goals in certain ways in that she's trying to awaken Sigurd, is that if I remember correctly? Yeah. And I'm wondering if Basim missed something there by not working with her to, to make sure that Tyr awakened inside. Um, so, well, he didn't know it was Tyr. He thought he was he was trailing Havi. But um, I wonder if he missed something there with Fulke and, and aligning with her and, and getting his goals in that from, from that point of view. Um, or whether he had a plan, you know, how was he how was he going to awaken Havi and or Tyr in these two people he'd met? Um, maybe he was just hoping. Again, this is all part of that master plan that when when you think about it, you realise this whole sage plan uh, has, has many <laughs> holes. Yeah, I don't... Um, if, I'm a rem if I'm remembering right, um, he just knew that Fulke had uh, some stone that they were looking for. Oh, yes. Um, but I actually, I forget what the stone was for. Like... Could it open something, or was it used to read the Isu text that they found? I don't remember. Mm, but yeah. uh, but he was basically just after the stone and probably wrote her off as like, you know, she's just a crazy religious person, not really worth working with her. But then, you know, he, real he realized that she was actually playing them, that she was more intelligent maybe than he cra gave her credit for. Yeah, and after yeah. that point, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, go to her anymore and and say, "Hey, can we work together?" <laughs> like he knew she wouldn't buy it. Yes, yes, she may have been. She was a. She had very definite beliefs and maybe was not open to uh, to discussion with him. Um, and it's also possible that he planned the whole time to take Sigurd back to Norway once he, you know uncovered what he you know what what loki thought or what what basim thought was his true personality as javi 
maybe the plan was the whole time to somehow bring him to Norway so they could um, like open access to Yggdrasil. Igr- Good point. Yeah. I don't, we don't really know what the plan was with him, but I feel like he really wanted it to be personal between them. Mm. That he mm. wouldn't have wanted help from someone like Folke because he really wanted this to be like his revenge. Yeah, he certainly, uh, when, when the realization hits him, he certainly doesn't hold back in his fight with Eivor, does he? Yeah. Um, he, he lets <laughs> the rage flow, that's for sure. To his own detriment. Yeah. Like, yeah. Before this point, he's he's always been very calculating in his moves. But once he like lets the rage overtake him, he starts to make mistakes. And that's why Eivor is able to get the upper hand. Yeah. That was a hard fight. I remember that taking a long time. He has he has some good special attacks, <laughs> as I recall. He does have some pretty cool moves, like yeah. from a technical gameplay kind of kind of mm. can i can i ask you like so, if you push him game... over the edge you you can yeah you can Go push on, him over the edge uh like and he will he'll appear to fall but then he'll like you like he throws a smoke bomb and that's how he he can come back to the fight so it appears that he do, he falls throws a smoke bomb and then he emerges from the smoke back to the arena so he never like he can never die from falling that is cool i mean that's cool from a sort of a, a programming you know and as you say like animated, yeah it is uh, move point of view also annoying that he gets smoke yeah. bombs and we don't until later but anyway different different topic um yeah can we talk about gameplay for a bit because you you've been exploring mods for a while <laughs> and one of the first times too just for this game well, it's because I, I mean you've taken many pictures, um, but I'm curious with the mods running and having Basim as the sort of the, the playable skin. I'm assuming it's Avor's animations and combat moves, or can you yeah. unlock some of the moves that he does? No, it's just a skin for Avor. Okay, it's just like like gotcha. putting on an outfit. Gotcha, because it was you you doing that. I mean, they've been sort of experimenting for a while, and what I will say. Um, just to people listening is it's been a, a long sort of term complaint for many people that, that stealth in Valhalla hasn't worked. I pretty soon gave up trying it myself when I couldn't enter any village without being detected very easily. Um, there's been a recent patch, which has addressed in my limited testing seems to have addressed a fair bit of that. Certainly I found stealth a lot more um, viable when I was doing the Isle of Sky. Um, a fated encounter I did a number of the locations stealthily and stealth worked exactly how I thought it should which was great but I watched um, Six Keys do a a stream for maybe an hour or so playing as Basim blending hiding whistling and honestly it was a I felt like it was a Valhalla stealth masterclass watching uh, (laughs) watching you uh, as Basim um, taking down the guards it was fantastic to watch Uh, you're you're definitely over exaggerating my skills <laughs> no not at all because you were using all the tools of the game all the blending spots and the monks and and environmental um uh hiding as well it was great to watch i really enjoyed it um what, well, what's, you. <laughs> what's, what's the sort of complexity involved in because i've i've been dabbling in the last few days in unity and what's possible there and it's blooming complex <laughs> it's the short answer is is it complex with with valhalla if you want to have uh basim as your um your playable character uh not really um the i guess the most complex thing was uh basically what you have is like um you ha- have these different uh, face models uh all the face models that that are available in the game so all npcs um and the base model for Basim is obviously Loki. Uh, so okay. you just have to like find, then you have like all these options listed of different hairstyles and beard styles and um, sideburns and goatees. <laughs> and so you, you kind of have to mix and match all the yes, components yes. of the head as well. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing. Like you, you can, with these mods, the idea is, of course, that you can customize your character, customize Avor to look whatever look like whatever you want them to look like. Um, so, 
basically you can you can make him look like Basim or Hytham or any any of the other NPCs but you just have to find the right combination of hairstyles and beards and that can look a bit weird for a while I'll bet I'll bet I was uh, experimenting with unity uh, yesterday or the day before and um <laughs> I I ended up making Arno entirely invisible um, which was quite yes, fun. I saw that. <laughs> oh, did you? See? Yeah. So, so he was walking around Paris with just his sword and his gun bobbing on his. Well, his gun's bobbing. Yeah, on it his just arm. looked like like this. Yeah. the sword and the gun had gone on a walk. Exactly. All by exactly. themselves. So it is kind of <laughs> hilarious. I'm amazed it didn't crash, but it is kind of hilarious what you can do. I mean, I, I have a few goals in mind for Unity, but it may be impossible to achieve. But it's, it was great to watch your um, your gameplay. Anyway, but I still didn't find a, a mod for disabling the blending effects. Ah, I looked. That's a shame because I've got a really nice portrait of Avor um, blending at um, what do you call it? Like a, a donative box where you'd put your your coins for the church. Um, yeah, the tithing box. Right. Okay. Yeah, and it's a beautiful picture. The lighting's nice, but she's got the white glow around her, and it would be yeah, so nice yeah, to exactly. not have the white glow. Um, yeah, we should so... have an option in the in the in-game options to disable that effect definitely because people who know about blending they can already know you know how to play the game without the effect mm. Mm. and i think if you disable those options then you know you can you are knowingly taking the risk that if if you get detected maybe you didn't pay enough attention or something but uh, i'm always for more options definitely i mean that's something we should probably call out to to the people doing all the post release um support and development is the number of options we've been given over time to control melee combat and then in in this current release to really customize um the stealth experience i don't know whether all the settings work fully yet i haven't to be honest i haven't tested it but so just to have those options to really control the 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 gameplay is fantastic let's hope there's more like you say with with user interface changes or, or um yeah user effects or whatever you want to call it um changes because it is possible because in the uh discovery tour those effects don't exist in blend spots ah so they're all there it just needs the right flag to be made available to us in the ui yeah all right interesting um we may have gone a little bit off topic declan would you like to add anything um no i think we've covered everything that i had in my nice little notebook i'm just double checking um no i think we've covered everything fun fact in my notebook apparently i had this episode booked down for the 3rd of january so <laughs> <laughs> turns out i have lost track of time over christmas <laughs> our schedule was was a little bit um <laughs> changed wasn't it with the uh, crossover release you know we we did um a, a very quick crossover um reaction episode then we did the an episode on the odyssey half an episode on the valhalla half um, so no, normal service has been resumed as of today. Which is good. But no, I think we've covered everything. Unless uh, you are six keys, has got anything else you'd like to say? Oh, guests first, always. Um, I did think of something earlier when we were discussing uh, about ISO society and what what Loki can tell us about how, how it works, basically, is... Something that uh, I think Amit brought up uh, during one of our discussions on the Sisterhood Discord was uh, like the the sexism in in Valhalla in in the Isu sections where you know there's this moment where Loki basically slut shames Freya for sleeping with so called too many people. Um, Whoa! I'm, I yeah, he that. he like makes his comment. Uh, Freya says, um, uh, "I will not barter with my body uh, when 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 she is offered up as the prize for the builder." Uh, and she gets mad at that, and she says, "I will not barter with my body." <clears throat> and Loki says, "That would be a first, Ooh. <laughs> because in, in the myth even in the mythology, Freya is basically slut shamed all the time." <laughs> wasn't in the mythology? Wasn't she? Um... A troll king wanted Freya as a bride, but then instead they sent four dressed as sent Loki and four, and four was dressed as Freya because Freya didn't want to be pawned off as someone's bride. 
it was kind of a weird moment that everyone seems to want to be Freya's husband. <laughs> so it could be. But to, to be fair, that mythology is hilarious because Thor's there in a proper uh, wedding gown and the troll thinks it's Freya eating tons of, like, two cows worth of steak and four tankards of beer. And he's like, Freya can eat a lot. And he's like, no, nope, I'm just <laughs> hungry. Drops his veil. It's like, no, I'm, I'm actually, you know, Thor, you stole my hammer because you wanted to be Freya's husband. So I'm just going to, like, knock you all out and eat all your food. But <laughs> <laughs> mythology is weird. It is. <laughs> well, to be right, honest, earlier when, when you two were describing some of the, the sort of the family feuds and the infighting and the the origins of these these Norse Norse gods, which of course to us are, are Isu, um, they're not exactly superior beings for humans to look up to, are they? Even though they no, created they're just... us, they're they're scumbags. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're kind of like ancient superheroes in a way. In that, yes, yes, they're so-called basically human underneath just with very strong powers like that's mm. that's how people used to see them i think not as these um like not always heroic figures to look up to as moral guides but more like flawed beings Good with point. immense power it, judging by how like the whole north mythology has worked out compared to like Greek mythology, I don't think the Norse gods themselves really bothered with humans because you know you got the nine realms and Midgard was all humans. But other than humans coming to the halls of Valhalla for Odin, they never really left Asgard to do wonder with the humans. They didn't really give a crap about <laughs> humans. Like let's be honest, like hmm. in Ragnarok, they left two humans in the world tree so anything burned the first two humans came out but they didn't give two crops about them they were having a big battle in asgard and didn't think will the humans be all right down there do you think <laughs> you think we should like check on them like nah 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 i've had my eye on that world serpent for years i'm gonna kick its ass and if it burn <laughs> all nine realms it's fair play i'm getting my bit of beef it's fair play so so are I you mean, saying that's... you want nine DLCs over the next two years then to, to cover all nine realms? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is <laughs> Six Keys has got an interesting point about the Isu civilization because mythology and humans can play too much problem where Isu look like they respect humans and the Isu are, should be worshipped by humans. Whereas with Norse mythology where, they eat, where the gods do whatever they own want and they don't give a crap about humans, you start to develop a real life understanding of how the Isu just do their own thing and don't care of the consequences. You know, humans are the lesser species as they were created, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I think it's kind of similar in the Greek mythology, on which some of the earlier AC gods or Isu are based, like Juno and Jupiter and Minerva. Greek mythology was also very similar in, in some ways to the North Norse gods, in that they were more concerned with their own squabbles yes. than everyday yes. humans, <laughs> and they only like they just messed with humans just for fun when they got bored. Mm. Mm. But what I wanted to say uh, was that um, it could also be a sign, you know, the, the whole slut-shaming thing. It could kind of point to another problem within the Isu society is that maybe they also had, like, these very specific ideas about sex and gender. And uh, because Loki is maybe an outsider also because of his fluid sexuality or his gender presentation. Because obviously he's a shapeshifter and he doesn't seem to have a problem shape-shifting into men or women he doesn't really care who he sleeps with <laughs> could be a horse you know <laughs> yeah. um and maybe that that says something about the Isu society too maybe that is something they also look down upon and maybe that's another reason why he was an outsider it's a point that i've always made as well with there is in norse mythology there is no real reason why Asgardians and Jotunheimans should be fighting, you know, they could work together, but if we took that from a Isu standpoint, it's kind of an interesting story point that, oh, Harvey is Aesir, and 
Loki is Jotunheim, but there's bad blood between the two of them, which is weird because they're part of the same Aesir race, so it just shows there's a bit of racism between each other. Like They may yeah. not be so fond of other clans. So Yeah, exactly. It would also make sense, tying into all Aesir law, why the sage machine that the Norse a- um, Aesir made isn't similar to the others because they didn't want to share the technology. They were just like, you know, this is ours. We may have the capital triad, but this is ours. No one else yeah. is getting hands on it. This is our stuff. Back off. Exactly, yeah, because Odin only chose people from his close circle. Not like he, he wanted to share the technology even with other Isu leaders from other nations. No, he was like, this is all from my people. Mm. All, only for my trusted eight. But is it not the same technology that Aita used for his sages? Or is it something different? Yeah, because um, there's the scene in Asgard at the well uh, with Hirokin, or however you're supposed to pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, and that is Juno. Yes. Um, yes. And I don't remember what exactly the deal was, but something like she she was able to get the secret uh, that Javi was going to use for this method um, through some kind of bargain with him. And that's why she was able to, like, she did something with the, with the technology that allowed her to use it on Aita. Ah, okay. So he, they exchanged. Yeah. That they sort of both had two parts of the fo- of the full solution, and they exchanged yeah. technology, if you like, to to both allow both parties to create sages. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And Juno tampered with the serum in some way that changed it so that Aita is able to get born to to reincarnate several times over, whereas the method that Odin and the others used. They are only able to reincarnate once. Uh, wow! Hang on a minute. Um, my jaw has just dropped. So it's not like they were endlessly popping up in human history. They had a one-shot deal. Yes. It, oh my god! Apparently, right. like okay. this. This was uh, confirmed by Darby somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. Jeez. Well, they were very lucky that they all woke up apart. Right, from like them. that. That's my whole thing. That's why I said like. It, it was a really stupid plan, ultimately, because Aver could have died at nine years old, and that would yeah. have been the end of Odin. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, the fact that they all happen to be together in the same period of time, you know, roughly in the same part of the world, is enough of a um, enough of a coincidence. But I didn't realize that was their one shot. Yes. I assumed that, like Aita, they would pop up at random times and they just needed to all be around at the same time. Oh, man, right, okay. Yeah, and that's okay. that's why it's so tragic that uh, Heimdall was <laughs> born too early because he never got to reuni- reunite with his friends. Damn, I need to go back and read the, um, what was it called, the, the Rigasuka or Rigsugur. Rigsugur, okay, I need to go back and read that <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the Magus Codex, just to reread that. I'm sure it's on the wiki. I think this also just shows that something that I've been thinking about for years, and Valhalla proved it. Juno isn't working with the Capital Triad. She's working on her own agenda. And seeing how sages can't just pop up randomly, but Juno's husband, Ataya, can't, what is she planning ultimately? You know, even though she, her failed resurrection was in the comics, I doubt that's the end of her. I doubt there's something more coming. But what could it be? Which is kind of intriguing to me. But but sages. I just want more sages, to be honest. More Bassin. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take more Bassin. So, is there <laughs> any more points we'd like to discuss? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. I think I'm just very, as we've said during this, this show, I'm very much looking forward to see what does modern day Bassin do next? Who does yeah. he side with? Who does he support? Who does he trick? Who does he betray? Which which personality wins? Is it his Basim personality or his Loki personality? So it's going to be fascinating to see how it develops. Yeah. In a game. Oh, not in a I game. Wanna, <laughs> and I'm not rip, trying to rip off revelations here, and I know I'm going to do, but I would love it to come point in like a game point where Basim and Loki's personality struggles, and we have another 
Revelations anime style incident where both personalities are trying to fight for control, but instead of having like Clay and Desmond trapped on high island, it'd just be two versions of Basim, Loki and Basim. <laughs> I think that would be cool to see. Kind of like the fight between Eivor and Odin. Yeah, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. But who would you Maybe. root to win? Would you root Loki <laughs> or Basim? <laughs> because they're the same person, essentially. So who would you want to win? Yeah, that's the thing. Like They are much harder to separate. Because we don't really know the so-called real Basim. Mm. Mm. I, w- I will just say, in the Eivor versus Havi fight, it... Um... It took me an embarrassingly long time to work out that I needed to drop the axe. Um, the game had to give me a me very too, because big I didn't pop-up. remember I had an axe. <laughs> well, no, because I hadn't used an axe for sort of 150 hours at that point. <laughs> right? Like, you need to unequip. I an axe. I, I went through the entire game. <laughs> I went through the entire game using a knife. Right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, you know, the game keeps pointing at those those glowing outlines, and the axe is highlighted in gold. And I kept seeing these glowing <laughs> outlines. Okay, it's reminding me of my journey, my history. And in the end, I, I don't know if, if you saw this as well, Declan, but if you don't unequip the axe, the game gives you a very big pop up in the <laughs> middle of the screen. You know, you really ought to unequip Varin's axe at this point if you'd like to proceed. Oh, oh, right. Okay, that's what I've got to do. Fine, fine. Um, but yes, it took me a long time to work that out. <laughs> I had to Google how to beat. Him. Like I was so <laughs> confused. I will yeah. admit I spent ages and when it said you need to unequip Varen Sax, I was like, what do you mean? You know, and I ignored it and I kept trying to do it. <laughs> so I Googled it and it's like go to menu unequipped. Oh, that's what you mean unequipped. I thought I just was special. I didn't know yeah. I had to actually go to the menu yeah. and unequipped it. What is this crap? Yeah. But it I is kind of a cool myself. mechanic though, I think. Like from it's, a from a design point of view, there's something kind of Kojima esque about it. I think from a production but a mental capacity, like memory wise, it was perfect. You know, the whole embodiment of her life on X, so she lets it go, is a physical yeah. manifestation. And Harvey Go is just perfect. It's just yeah, you couldn't do it any other way without giving it a real life reason to drop it, and. Yeah, I kind of thing. It was the best ending for that fight ever, and it's something that you can literally only do in a video game. Like mm. often, these games are just made to be mm. movie-like, so like non-interactive scenes. Uh, but this was really like, no, you as the player, you have to figure out what to do, you know, with the game's own mechanics, and I think that's cool. We need more like it. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> I think this may be all we've got time for tonight, I believe. I think so. Um, thank you for joining Six Keys. Thank you. Um, thank if... you for letting me ramble about my favourite character. <laughs> oh, I'm allowed to ramble about mythology, and James is allowed to ramble about Unity, so... Oh, we we, we, we don't go an episode without me shoehorning in a Unity reference, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's all, part of the, all part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ramble Assassin's Creed. Absolutely. See, that would be a Declan. We need to change the name of the podcast. There we go. <laughs> well, that's why was Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. You know, tagline Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, a fan podcast where we discuss everything from Assassin's Creed. It's literally anything. Could a horse be an assassin? Why not? <laughs> we if have it... an assassin turkey. Exactly. We do. Why not? Yeah. I mean, could if, if a battering same... ram can can knock over Basim, then why can't a horse <laughs> assassinate somebody? That's what we've learned tonight. What if somebody, you know, inputted the codes wrong into a sage machine and instead of human DNA, it was animal DNA and it came back as a chicken? That that would be priceless, you know, a talking chicken that remembers its Isu life. <laughs> I don't so, know. If that when, when are you joining the writing team for the next game, Declan? <laughs> I would love an opportunity <laughs> to chat to the right team for ideas. I'll be like, come on, people. Like, I had an old idea in Syndicate. I thought it'd be hilarious if Jacob got drunk one day and started seeing a talking dog in the streets. Proper British bulldog style at Winston Churchill. But he's just having a drunk excavate thinking he's doing assassin missions <laughs> for a bulldog. Uh, but we already hilarious. have Desmond. In, we already have Desmond the dog, Desmond the corgi in uh, Syndicate, so he could get <laughs> drunk and chat to Desmond. Exactly. That would have been more hilarious. You know, yeah. Sh- Sean popping like, what are you doing? It's not the real Desmond. Shit, oh. it, all this talk about animals reminded me of something else that I wanted to bring up. 
<laughs> go, go on, go on. Before go before Declan does his closing <laughs> spiel, let's let's get some more points in. Come on, six keys, go it's for it. <laughs> the thing thing that we don't actually know what Basim's children are. Are they uh, like Isu? Are they human-like, or are they some kind of an experiment? And he just refers to them as his children. Ah, well. Sorry, to, sorry, Devin, you were about a 10 seconds away from closing the show. So one of the notes I wrote down, and again, this is because I have no knowledge of Norse mythology prior to starting this game. Loki's wife, partner was, geez, where are my notes? Angra Boda, was it? Yeah, that right? or that that was, that's Alifia, basically. Right, that's Alifia. Because he had another wife that we don't see. Oh, he did. Okay, because m- my train of thought there, Six Keys, was... And again, memory's not great. Angra Boda was one of the blue, uh, very tall people. Yeah, Jotun. Jotun. But that's how the Greco-Roman Isu are presented. God, we're going into layers of meaning now. So the Greco-Roman Isu are presented as Jotun in the mythology arcs. Yeah. So it's... Are, are they... And this is this is almost heading into eugenics, and it's not a particularly pleasant conversation in some ways, but... Are they sort of crossbreeds or are they the same species or was he simply looked down on Loki? I mean, because he was sort of having relations with with people outside of his sort of local family. Um, it's um, it's interesting. But like you say, would they have been half Jotun, half Aesir um, children, creatures, animals? Um, go on, Declan. Sorry, I didn't think I had mic on for a second. Um just wanted to point out, and it's the biggest thing that I am in love with in the game. In the Jotunheim world, um, there is actually a torn page from a journal, and I found it. And it does say, this day we came upon a fascinating sight here of the old, did the gods of the Aesir rest on the return from our realm? In their wake were three of the monstrous form, the spawn of Lukoju, and she who tames tongues, a worm, a pup, a child half dead. The worm, though young, was growing before their eyes, so the gods mm. tied to a tree as they slept. When morning came, they released it and went on the way. Which is the mythology of Loki's three children being captured. Yeah. So, they don't actually call them... Spawn of Lokaju must be the Jotunheim's version of Loki, and she who tames tongues must be his wife. And I think the whole translation of worm and pup and a child half dead I think it may have something to do with the Olympus project. Yeah, that's what I like. That's that's one of the possibilities that's been in my mind is ah. maybe these are not literal children, but uh, like Angerbora is uh, described as a witch in in Jotunheim, but that could be like she's basically she's a scientist. She's like a they scientist. say, she dabbles yes. in black magic, yes. but she actually dabbles in experiments. And what if the children are some kind of powerful experiment that they these two did together, and they refer to them as their children? Is I... it Ang- sorry? Just a very quick question: Is it Angraboda who we speak to, who is stood in front of that black mirror, and we hear Ezio's voice? No, it? that's um... is that Hirokin? No, Hirokin is Juno. Angraboda is Alithia. Yeah. Um. God, I I never remember. But uh, because basically, when you said the one we... I was thinking of her in that room with various sort of experiments to to preserve the Isu, and thinking that was Angra Boda as well. But I don't remember all the names. No, that's of the uh, characters. It's Minerva that we ah. see in front of the mirror, but I don't remember her Norse name. No worries. Okay, understood. Um, I kind of have a more of a sad interpretation of the cre- of the three children. Um, as I said before, you know how uh, Loki's two. Aesir children could have been adopted. I always thought that Agriboda, people assumed he was his wife and his lover, and she was, but they couldn't have kids, so they tried to create their own kids. Yeah. And how I interpret it is Hell was the first child. Um, I can't remember who was born first, but the process didn't work, so she started dying, so half dead. The second child, Yorndinta, worked too well and the child would not stop growing, so the age process was not fixed. The last child, Fenyr, was probably the one that did work well, but Odin knew that the last child, who was well enough, 
would take revenge on Odin in the future for some reason, maybe something linked. So I kind of saw the interpretations as more them trying to have a child that they could never have naturally, so they tried to do genetic one, but genetics is hard, so they could never get the child right till Fenrir. But I don't know if that's a good enough way to look at it. It's a really interesting theory, at least. It's kind of a sad theory to think about, you know, to try sad, and have Sad to... theories are the best. <laughs> but it, to be honest, it's the kind of theory that would work better with Basim's character. You know, the fire scene, he talks about losing his son, you know. The greatest thing a father could lose is not being able to have a son, you know. He's adopted two children and he wants one of his own to hold. And he's lost three because one is prophesied to kill Odin. And two, they could never get the process right. And that would make Basim's hunt for Odin much more gripping because maybe the capital tried look down on this. You should not be tampering mm. with Isu yeah. genes. You should not be making more kids. You you can't have kids. Don't have them. I know it's well, very they, harsh They weren't to happy say. with the Olympos project, were they? Poseidon yeah. and so on. So, so yeah, you could it, definitely look at it like that. I think that's the theory that I'm going to have always brought, thought of that. Maybe these are just interpretations of genetics gone wrong because Loki just wanted to be a dad. And I can kind of see Basim just wanting to be a dad at the end of the day. He wants a family to call his own. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting very emotional for Basim here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you think. see why I like him. Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. just, there, there's so many possibilities. You know, as a dad myself, you know, I've got two boys, you know, I could see... I could get into a- Basim's mind and say, you know, if I'm bringing up two Aesir children that are not mine, I would want to make my own flesh and blood. You know, and the damning process of going through it and seeing someone who shared a blood oath with you, who's given you a roof of your head, condemning it, you would want to call him mad. Why are you condemning it when you've agreed to help me through anything? Yeah. Now I hate Odin more. Great. <laughs> He doesn't As come out should. well. He does not come out well of this story, does he? <laughs> he never does. Nope. Nope. I'm glad we're all agreed on that. And what, one, one thing that I was also thinking here is that... Um, I'm sorry, I keep going. <laughs> no, it's great. I'm laughing because um, <laughs> we, we do this all the time, you know, and especially when you've got guests on who are passionate about topics and... Um, you know, we, we always say to ourselves, look, if we if it's just the two of us, we'll maybe talk for an hour. That That's fine. And we'll, we'll go longer if we have more to say. If we've got a guest, it's usually 90 minutes because, again, there's more people to talk, <laughs> more, more to say. But, of course, it's always the way where you think, oh, hang on a minute, and another thing. So you carry on. It's great. <laughs> as, as I always say, it's just making Declan's job with the audio edit harder. So carry on. Yeah, that, that, that's why I feel <laughs> sorry. Like, I'm, I'm sorry that we're making your editing job harder. But um, what I wanted to say was... Uh, I feel like it's another interesting aspect of Loki's character is that he seems to value loyalty so highly. Like he takes it as the ultimate insult that, you know, Odin would betray him in some way that he would like try to take his family away um, because they were so, supposed to be friends, best friends even. Um, he he seems to, and he and he's of course also like really loyal to his wife or or to anger Bora, actually to his lover and that's the thing he he is married uh and yet he he sees fit to to criticize others for being disloyal while making an exception for himself because he cheats on his wife with yeah. anger Bora. yeah and i think that that makes him an interesting character I won again it, it it points us back to dawn of ragnarok will that just be sort of action go and kill the slay the bad guys with your massive axe or will it be continuing these stories very closely with lots of narrative and character development let's see and it's like what is what in a what in ac mythology is the reason that he decides to cheat on his wife like mm. it could be tied to the whole thing. Maybe, maybe they are not able to have children. Maybe that's why he seeks ah. love elsewhere. 
there are only yeah. more ways we can just like really, really open our hearts to Vasim and just be like sucked into his life and invest <laughs> in his character because he is a misunderstood person. Yeah. Uh, it feels like this whole yeah. episode is this is AC characters. They're in a hole six foot deep. This is Basim, and the hole just gets so big you're never going to get out of it because you don't know who he is and why you love him so much. <laughs> He's like a puppy you get at Christmas and you always want to look in those eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and we all hate Odin more now. I've always Absolutely. hated Odin. I love Norse mythologies, <laughs> but Odin is just an absolute douche. But I, I've always liked Loki because Loki's <laughs> Loki does stuff for people even though they hate him, you know. He took Thor to that wedding, dressed as Freya, just for Thor to get his hammer back. Didn't have to, but he did. <laughs> Very good of him. And I think I even... need to borrow your book on Norse mythology and actually learn something about the uh, the original stories. Oh, that's a good. Just, oh, I would. Just stay away from the goat story. Oh, there's always a goat. What is it with goats? Uh, Loki goat piece of string makes a giant laugh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say it's NSFW for this podcast. Gotcha. But goat string, God laugh, perfect story. But Loki <laughs> will do anything to. Ha- I think the thing is, I think the last thing I've got about Bastin is <laughs> Loki in mythology is a trickster. He is a rogue, but he has loyalty. He does everything, and all the stories I've read, and I would recommend Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology. It's a retelling. Um, Louise from the Nerdy Archer told me to read it. Perfect. When you read the stories he's put in there, you realise that end of the day, Loki is just having fun. End of. A lot of times his fun is a bit too far, but there's a whole thing where he turns into a seal to steal a necklace from Freya. No malice, he's just wanting to be a seal to steal a necklace. And, that's <laughs> and he has a fight with Heimdall as a seal. Don't understand that. It's not <laughs> myth. But Heimdall and him have a fight as seals over Freya's necklace. But He's just having a laugh at the end of the day. He's just a good guy. He's just having a joke. Give him a break. <laughs> I like that. He's just memeing his way through life. Yeah, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Pretty much, literally, who... And I mean, it's reflected in his name as Basim too, right? Because Basim course, one means smiles. smiles. Yeah. And Ibn yeah. Ishak means laughter. So it's Smiley, <laughs> the son of laughter. Gotcha. And it would fit because... Who in the right mind would go, you know what, I need to win a bet, I don't want to anger the gods, I'm going to go make my life with a horse and have a baby horse, <laughs> just because I don't want to lose a bet. <laughs> That's Loki, that is why Bastion is such a cool character, because Loki is just nuts, he will do anything for fun. I really want to hang out with Loki, to be honest. <laughs> Let's be honest, you're gonna have a lot of fun with him aren't you more fun than oh, some yeah. of the others <laughs> if you read his myths he is a dick sometimes but at heart he's just trying to like as you said meme himself through the world mm. he steals mm. false hammer for a laugh you know he has no malice against false hammer he just steals it <laughs> so i think that is all we've got time for and i'm really scared about editing now <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Never be sorry because nah, it's been great. It's been I've great. loved it, and yeah, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And if anyone else has any thoughts on Basim or Loki that would like to share, you can hit us up on Twitter at AC Let's Talk or at James Tiddlyquid. I'm never going to be able to see your Twitter about laughing. And no worries. Happy to uh, happy to oblige. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can also email us at Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at No Wait. Oh my god. I get my email address wrong every episode. <laughs> Assassin's what, Creed. One day we're going to do like podcast bingo where everything that you do and will be on like a, a bingo card. Every time you mess up the email address, <laughs> you tick it off. Every time I say, um, really obviously and loudly, you tick that off. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we need to turn this into a drinking game. Oh, oh I love it. Don't, Let's do it. Because I swear to God, if we did, I'll probably get an email going, excuse me. Big fan of your show, listen to an hour podcast, and I don't remember 10 minutes of my life afterwards. <laughs> because I took a shot every time you messed something up. Yeah, I, I can't be responsible, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it'd be interesting. So, my actual email address is Assassin's Creed Let's Talk at. No, Assassin Creed. G- oh my god. I'm, I'm going to have to edit this out, but it's Assassin's <laughs> Creed at Gmail, Let's Talk at Gmail.com. Sorry about that, my 
brains fried. It's the first week back at school, and I think my head's gone all over the spot. Um, so if you're listening, then I can't wait to hear what you think, and we'll see you all next week. See you soon.